Welcome, everyone. This is great. It's a full house. We have a, a fan club here of Lucia and Stephanie. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Matilda McQuaid, and I'm acting curatorial director here at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And again, thanks for coming out on this Saturday afternoon. Um, and I hope that some of you have seen, if not all of you, have seen, I know Lucia hasn't seen it yet, but um, the Acquired show upstairs, Acquired Shaping the National Design Collection, because this is part of the, the programming around that exhibition, and Lucia has a piece in the exhibition, um, which we'll go through later, and there's a whole kind of segment on women in design, and so that it's a nice, um, this is a nice accompanying program to that. Um, I wanted to thank um, the Learning, Audience, and Engagement um, Department for putting this all together. They had the great idea of including Egg Collective with Stephanie here, and so really, really happy to have this conversation, and especially Alexa, thank you so much for all the, all the great work you did. And we don't normally have pro adult programming on Saturday afternoons, and I don't know, maybe that's gonna change because this is a great turnout. So um, again, thank you all for coming. So I'm going to just do brief introductions to the two, um, my two guests here, and I think they have a great write-up on, on the website, so I'll let you read more in depth about them, but it's really on the occasion of Lucia um, de Ref's penis, the respiness. I always get that wrong, and I've been repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. The respiness. The respiness. I'm going to get it by the end of this. Um, she has been an industrial designer um, for over 60 years. She graduated from Pratt Institute, and I think we're going to later on take a, um, a head count or a hand count of all the Pratt students here. She graduated there in 1952 with a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Art in Industrial Design in a class of primarily men, and I think it was, you were one of three women or two women? Well, three, and then one had a uh, psychological problem, mm -hmm. and uh, she left, okay. so there were just two of us left. Two of us, okay. Yeah. She went on to practice in an industry that was also primarily men, um, notably as a senior designer at George Nelson Associates from 1954 through 63. And she continued to practice independently, working for a variety of companies through the 80s. And she went on to teach at Pratt from 1979 until she retired in 2020 at the age of 93. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> And the only reason I think she retired was because of COVID, and it went to mm -hmm. virtual teaching, and she said, you cannot teach 3D on a 2D screen. Um, Lucia is also a recipient of a number of awards, including being named a fellow of the Industrial Society of America. And just a quick note that she became um, an industrial designer before the founding of IDSA in 1965. Stephanie Beamer is a designer and co-founder of Egg Collective, a furniture design and manufacturing company founded in 2011 with um, Hilary Petrie and Crystal Ellis, and it's based in New York, um, in Tribeca. They have a showroom and they have a manufacturing facility in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Egg Collective is a creative partnership synthesizing the founders' backgrounds in art, architecture, and woodworking. In addition to the design and production of its own furniture, the company also represents a small selection of emerging and mid-career artists and designers. Um, Stephanie is founding board member of the Female Design Council, and she received her BFA in architecture from Washington University in St. Louis, along with her two um, co-founders. So I want to start our discussion with actually how these two um, women met. Um, this is the showroom of Egg Collective um, down in Tribeca. And Egg Collective started a, um, a series of exhibition called Designing Women. And, um, and Lucia was part of that 
series. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to see about if you could just talk a little bit about specifically the exhibition um, that Lucia was a part of in 2021 and, and how you got to know about her work. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so we actually met Lucia, the, the three founding partners of Egg Collective, years back at a uh, Design Within Reach photo shoot. Um, we were getting our portrait taken um, individually for um, products that we had designed that were represented by the company, but they were doing a larger photo shoot for women who had designed products across the um, Design Within Reach catalog. So that was the first time that we met Lucia. Mm -hmm. um, we founded the Designing Women series in 2017, and we iterated on it in future years. And the, the series that um, Lucia was a part of was, was the third iteration called Designing Women Mother. And um, we focused strictly in that show on women who had design practices and careers who had also become mothers within their lifetime. Um, so Lucia was one of the eldest living designers represented in the show at that time in 2020 and continues to, or 2021 rather, and continues to be with us today. We had this piece, the Beehive Lamp on loan from us from R and Company. And it was actually, the, the concept for Mother had come about prior to the pandemic. It was a show that we were putting together uh, prior to the pandemic, but the topic of which became even more important um, once the pandemic had so, sort of fully taken uh, over and, and the effects that it was having on, on mothers and, and women who were required to, and often in many cases, be the, take the burden of being more at home and being pulled out of the workforce. So time and time again, you know, this, this issue is, is coming up. But um, Lucia was a star of the show at the, in the front of the gallery. And it was uh, our understanding that this piece, having been in the show, was how um, Cooper Hewitt came upon the piece and ultimately decided um, to bring it into their collection. So here's the, this is um, not our piece, but it's virtually identical to what is upstairs, what you'll see. And in terms of um, exhibitions, um, you have been um, part of um, many, and but also earlier in your career working for George Nelson and Associates. This is kind of a, a initial or an advertising um, uh, an ad for George Nelson and Associates, and here you can see the um, the beehive lamp on the upper left, as well as other lamps. Um, in, in terms of other exhibitions, you've been at the Whitney for um, a women in design show, mm -hmm. American Design. You've been part of Vitra's George Nel Nelson's traveling show. Um, so to get to the crux of it in terms of recognition, which is um, at, of women and specifically you in design, do you feel that you've received adequate recognition? Um, or w did you receive it during the time as opposed to, to now where your name is now everywhere. Um. Because I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, your, your past catches up with you. And um, at the time, I would go to an office and I would say, <clears throat> show my portfolio, of course, and they'd say, oh, your name is Lucia N. De Respinus, I thought it was Lucian. Oh, they thought it was the male of Lucia, uh, the male form of Lucia. And so they said, no, I don't think we can use you now. It was amazing how many times I would go to an office and they'd say, oh, you're a, they wouldn't say, oh, you're a woman, but uh, it was sort of obvious. But that leads to a story. Can I tell a story? Absolutely. Okay. Um, first of all, all the Pratt people should get up and leave because they've heard these <laughs> uh, a hundred times. I, I, well, I feel. Actually, raise your hands if you're from Pratt. Or, 
Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yay, Pratt. <laughs> but um, the story is, um, the first job I got was the August that I graduated from Pratt. I graduated in, um, in May. And um, they said, Monty Levin, who is a fairly well-known uh, designer of hardware and really, really tough sort of stuff, uh, is looking for a designer. So I went over, showed him my portfolio, portfolio. Um, he wanted a woman there. I thought, hmm, that's strange. Anyway, he looked and he said, oh, you're hired. And I noticed that the phone was on the board that I was going to use. And he said, would you mind answering the phone? I thought, ah, he wants everybody to think he has a secretary here. After two weeks, he realized I could do the work. And I said to him, uh, Monty, it would be good if everybody answered the phone. Why don't we put the phone over there? <laughs> and he said, oh, OK. Because for that time, he knew I wasn't going to uh, leave. And uh, he figured I was an addition to his staff of three. So it was a small office, but it was, it was a good place to learn a lot. And then uh, I heard that George Nelson, you know, I, tell, I told the students this too, a lot of your position in your profession is luck. I mean, you could say, yes, I'm a good, you know, I do this well and that well. Oh, I had a terrific portfolio. Yes, but a lot of it is luck. Um, there was a designer that was working at George Nelson's, and I knew him fairly well. I used to stop by. I lived over in the village, and I'd stop by and say hello, or else he'd give me a ring, and we'd have lunch or whatever. <clears throat> and this one day, I thought I would stop by, and I rang the bell, and he said, come on in, sit down. You want a coffee? Yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, George Nelson needs somebody else in the industrial design area. Uh, why don't you go over? I said, OK. He said, wear a black dress. <laughs> well, at that time, that was 1953, and women were wearing dresses, of course, at, at their jobs. So I had a black dress, and I looked pretty good in it. Um, <laughs> So I thought, well, yeah, OK. And I showed, uh, went in and showed George everything I had, and a whole portfolio, and, and all the stuff I had done for Monty, and uh, Monty Levin, the previous job. So he said, uh, OK, you're hired. Um, go talk to Irving Harper. So he was the vice president. So Irving said, yeah, uh, we could use you, all right. But if I hadn't stopped by to see that designer at that time, I wouldn't have known. Because uh, George didn't go advertising that he needed someone. It was always through other people. And he'd get an idea of if you could do the work or not. And you had to be very broad in your <laughs> understanding of what industrial design was. And uh, he would only hire those that somebody knew. And that was a really good way to form an office, because people knew each other pretty well then. The way the office was set up was very different than most offices. We were in the center, but there was a line of graphics people. Over here, there was architecture and an in interior design. And then the center area was industrial design. And we would walk around and look at each other's work and say, oh, what did you do that for? Or, oh, that's terrific. And why didn't you do this and this? You know, it was like a post-grad course. 
And it was, it was an office that produced a lot of, uh, a great variety of design. And I thought, this is a place to stay. <laughs> so we did a lot of wonderful things. We did the American exhibit in Moscow, which was a uh, real propaganda exhibit for America in Moscow. We took over a, a huge park in the middle of, uh, of Moscow and uh, uh, had buildings built by Welton Beckett and a couple of other architects and a big fan-shaped building that was all glass that would show American products. And uh, that was when Nixon was around. So I have a picture of, um, of Nixon and his wife coming in when finally the whole thing was finished, but it took almost eight weeks to finish. Uh, I was there for almost two months. I have a, I have a yeah. picture up on the screen of the, um, one of the pictures of the Moscow oh, yeah. exhibition. With I the, had to. With the Eames chairs stacked. Right. Well, one question I had is, Charlie's did chairs. you, were you the only woman in George Nelson's office when um, he hired you? I was the only industrial designer. There was um, um, Dolores Engel, who worked with the other, <clears throat> the sort of, the other business that George had was uh, an architectural business with Gordon Chadwick. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were only two people involved in that, Gordon Chadwick and Dolores Engel. And Dolores did all the interiors. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, the University of Georgia, uh, University of, I forget the name of it now, yeah. Uh. <laughs> no, it doesn't help. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, she did uh, all the interiors for uh, a couple of universities and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they, uh, Gordon Chadwick also designed a couple of uh, sort of memorable houses on, uh, on, out on Long Island, way out, way out toward Montauk. Um, <clears throat> and they were covered very extensively in the uh, architectural magazines at that time. But, it, but other than... But other than that, that I was the only the... woman who was an industrial designer there. And how, how did that, I mean, how did that work? I mean, how was that, you weren't asked Nobody to, to answer Nobody even thought about it. So it, I wasn't mean, a, it wasn't a big thing? Not a big thing. Hmm. No, uh, that was the interesting part. Being in that office was like you were one of the whole group and mm -hmm. and you all worked uh, occasionally together but i worked on my own in fact george would come over for the uh, abbott laboratory abbott laboratories had um, come to the conclusion that nerve growth factor in a person and this um, is an image of the of was the something the yeah nerve growth factor um, and that was the exhibit, <clears throat> was something that um, they had decided related to cancer, and that was the beginning of a lot of cancer research starting. And uh, they wanted to, they wanted an exhibit of this that the general public could understand, <clears throat> and that uh, also it didn't uh, talk down to the public, but also that um, <clears throat> people in science wouldn't say, oh, this is, this is too simple. So George gave me a stack this high of paper, and he said, go out to Abbott Laboratory, <clears throat> read through all this, and decide how we want to present this. So I didn't know it, but I was the only one doing it. So the little model you see is what I finally came up with. And this was for the exhibit, the uh, World's Fair exhibit in 1962. Yeah. Um, the, the New Seattle. York World's Fair was after that. Yeah, right. <clears throat> but that was the time of World's Fairs. 
and now we don't have anything like that. But it was fun to go to. Um, and there were a lot of new things that were shown at World's Fairs. And um, I remember going to the one in 1939 when I was, I don't know, 27, 37, 12 years old or something like that. And uh, that was great. I still remember it. Um, and then the one that we designed for at the Nelson office, which was the next one at uh, in New York, and that had uh, a huge Chrysler exhibit uh, that George did. I was involved in it. But I was too pregnant to go out and <laughs> present it to Chrysler. This was in 1963. And... Uh, or 62, yeah, because my daughter was born in 63. <clears throat> so George came back from a month in Europe and said, uh, okay, it's all finished, yeah, we have this big, huge <clears throat> model broken down in sections for Chrysler. He said, uh, what happened? <laughs> he looks at here I am. I said, I'm pregnant and I can't go. I'm sick every morning. <laughs> so he said, oh, no. So that was the end of that. I never did get to present what I had worked on for a month or two months. Yeah. So, in, I mean, in terms of kind of my question about recognition, do you feel, so it sounds like things were okay then in the George Nelson office in terms oh, of, yeah. in terms of, I think we got paid you the, less than the men. Yeah, probably. I, I probably. That was a standard procedure. Right. Women always got paid less than men. And, uh, but somehow you didn't think about that. I was just interested in the work because it was such a great place to work. I think even if I had known, I wouldn't have left. <laughs> <laughs> I would have swallowed my pride and said, well, the work's pretty good, so I'm staying. Well, and I think that's reflective, at least what I've noticed, of a generation of women, um, your generation, and maybe even hmm. a generation maybe older, that have, I mean, talking to some women architects, I mean, I long ago did a, an, um, a book about women in architecture and interviewed some, you know, at that point, they were, this was like 40 years ago, I guess, and there were... Um, you know, women that felt they didn't really see that, they didn't feel like they were, um, you know, it was biased at all in their workplace. They just loved the work yeah. and wanted to just, you know, continue doing it. I don't know how much they knew about the salary differences or if there were salary differences, I'm sure there were. But anyway, they, they really just loved the, the work and that's what drove them. Yeah, and, and I think when you're interested in the work you're doing and you're not a... A, oh, somebody is going to march, you know, you're not going to pick up on things like that because you're too involved with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you just ignore that fact. And I, <laughs> yeah. I wonder now, like with <clears throat> a younger generation how is of it designers, you? yeah, how is it's it? Stephanie. <laughs> How is it? Have things changed? So you, you, have like your own, you have your own business, so right. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, pay the men less. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any men in your? In we your, do. We do have men okay. in our organization. Um, I, you know, I think it's interesting. We've, as three women who founded a furniture company who studied architecture, we've been in multiple facets of, you know, a male-dominated spaces. I would say we were the first class in our undergraduate architecture to be actually 50-50. 50% men and 50% women. So mm. that was in 2002, so that was marking um, a, a moment of transition. I'm not sure what the numbers are today, but mm. that's just an educational piece, and of course there's attrition at every stage after that. And then we entered the furniture design um, realm, and um, not only furniture design, but furniture manufacturing, um, both of which are very male-dominated spaces. Yeah. Um, and it's not something that we ever really necessarily talked about. I think we got more questions about it than it was something that we thought about or brought up ourselves. Um, 
but over, I think also because we just felt like we're just here to prove ourselves. Like we don't, it's not, we don't need to talk about our gender. We don't need to talk about, you know, how we got here. We're no different. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time progressed um, and fe feeling discrimination in, in different aspects of our existence, I think it, and the culture shifting in ways that maybe we didn't necessarily expect it to, it's not always a forward trajectory, that we decided maybe we needed to take a step back and, and call a spade a spade, <laughs> so to speak, and, and recognize that there is still a dearth of, of women in various aspects of the design field, and then as that matriculates into you know, manufacturing and other trades, that there's still a lot to be talked about um, in terms of putting um, just examples for people to look to in order to see themselves in that role in the future. And so I think um, without examples in these various fields, women can't necessarily imagine themselves making it to various levels or being able to do certain things when um, there's still such a minority. Yeah. And where do you think this starts? I mean, I think of, I mean, we wanted to talk about education. I mean, do you think if there were more women, say, I mean, you do a lot of, um, you work with a lot of different manufacturers, whether it's, you know, woodworking, et cetera. Do you think if there were more women sort of either educated or taking, going to, you know, learning those technical skills, that there would be kind of more women in those positions or in those professions? Yeah, I mean, I think that trade schools in general seem to be something that are falling by the wayside, specifically here stateside. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge loss for us as, as a society, mm -hmm. but also without those opportunities and seeing people um, of all <coughs> genders and colors in mm -hmm. those spaces, then you don't necessarily feel like there's spaces that you can also enter. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's harder and harder to get into trades generally because there's, less opportunities, less mm -hmm. vocational training. Um, and it's it's hard for us to find, you know, diverse staff in terms right. of manufacturing because there aren't a lot of resumes coming through with a lot of diversity. Well, d when you were at Pratt, was there any requirements for learning certain skills? Did you do, did you have workshops and? Oh, sure. But uh, the industrial design course was, um, you had to take certain subjects. And um, amongst those were photography and uh, furniture and whatever. And uh, Pratt always had huge shops. A uh, shop, I can remember though, there was a, a definite feeling that the head of the shop, when I was there, as I'm remembering this now, and it's awful to remember, <laughs> they really didn't want women in the shop at a school. That was Pratt. And as a result, um, the women, <laughs> the other woman and myself, never got a sufficient training in using the big saws and uh, a lot of the equipment. And when I think of it, that was, I was deprived of that because I was a woman. And there was a, definitely a line between men going into the shop and women. You could take the test and then uh, they'd say, well, uh, don't use any of that because uh, there's no one here to sort of instruct and, uh, oh, <laughs> and it was, <laughs> so even at Pratt that was true. Um, women were not sort of allowed mm -hmm. to use anything that would harm them. <laughs> oh God, when I think of it, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and probably that wasn't, you know, Pratt wasn't the only school that 
did that. I'm Probably sure. not. I'm sure. Uh, even though there. I don't know whether uh, Rhode Island School of Design, they have wonderful shops now. I don't know what they were doing at that time or if they even existed. Do you know if they existed at that time, Rhode know. Island School of I Design? Know. I don't even know other than Pratt where industrial design was taught. Yeah. Well, but what about Wash U? I mean, did they have lots of shops that you were able to? Yeah, we had access to um, a wood shop um, at the architecture school at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where we did our undergrad. And I can say at least that changed. <laughs> that yeah. has changed, um, that we were not discouraged or prohibited from um, no. entering and using the shop. So um, I hope not. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we can say at least that much has changed. And, yeah. and it was actually that experience, working in the wood shop in the architecture school and taking furniture electives that led us out of architecture and into the scale of furniture design. So we have that sort of educational opportunity and the yeah. opportunity to use our hands and use the wood shop that sort of uh, lit that spark for us. Mm -hmm. Well, now the industrial design department at Pratt is half women. It may be more than half now. And uh, they can use, go into the shop and use anything, and it's a very full shop. Yeah. Wonderfully run by someone who's here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms uh, of um, industrial design, when you were studying at Pratt, it, it encompassed a lot of different types of design now that I think would be called, called out and be kind of a, a study unto itself, like whether it's graphic design or branding even, right. um, furniture design. You know, do you think, you know, kind of this idea of, you know, learning more generally about industrial design, do you think you learned more under that umbrella than sort of getting very specific about, you know, certain aspects of design? I think the one thing that Pratt did for me uh, was educate my eyes and uh, that allowed me to do almost anything. And a lot of times you don't, you don't get that education until your, maybe your last year or so. You just get used to seeing things and studying them and, and pulling apart the way you're seeing it. And uh, that was Rowena Reed's uh, contribution to Pratt. She, uh, she was a sculptor, basically. But she was Costello, who was head of the department. She was his wife. And she had gone to Europe and studied with Archipenko and uh, Lipschitz. And she had a way of treating form that she brought back and used in a course called three-dimensional design. 3D is still taught. It's still taught the same way, more or less, and for me, it was an eye opener and an eye education. Lots of times uh, students didn't catch on to it, but they would later on, I'm sure, um, because you're looking at things differently than also, you would normally. What, what was it that resonated so much with you? Well, you'd have to consider how a design holds together, or how an interior holds together. What are the things that, uh, that pull each other together within a design? To the point where I think um, designers now can design systems that really work. And their, um, their ability to broaden the field now in this generation, I think, is very important because uh, designers and the way they think are really important to most industry. And I think that, that 
that way of thinking about design and the way it can be applied to almost anything can broaden a student's thinking. And once they get out in the field, they have a much broader possibility of developing their talent and their, uh, their life in the field of design. You know. Did you have a, any kind of special epiphany at WashU, like she did, that kind of you know, brought it all together? Or is there, um, I don't know, something analogous to her? Well, I appreciate the way that you describe learning how to see in school. And it sounds like this class was very formative to that particular piece for you. But I, I think something that we always describe about our architectural education was yeah. even though we didn't Different. move into the field of architecture, it's such a broad and generalized education. And it requires so much of you from representation to graphics to mm -hmm. you know the various scales that you're thinking about the human body and how it relates to these things and and then ultimately electives that allow you maybe you know in our case to explore furniture design but we i always say i wouldn't have changed the de you know the degree that i got or what we studied because it was so broad and rigorous that i felt like it you could sort of do anything with that design yeah. education. Right. And I feel like there's an element maybe of what you described in terms of how broad the industrial design program was at the time that you were studying at Pratt, that you were able to learn so many facets of design that served you um, in various ways throughout your career. Even though you were, quote unquote, an industrial designer, you were also working in graphic design, you were working in exhibition design, yeah. and, and you were able to work across those fields because you had an understanding that was broader than something so specific. Yeah, I was kind of looking for you in the slides, but I, um, I know that Lisa has a story. My that mic. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've been zipping through these slides, um, and I know Lucia has a story for each one. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. So. <laughs> These were all these were all George Nelson. What and do you want to talk about this one? Because this one is such a fantastic clock. Oh, this is the, the eye clock. clock. Oh God. <laughs> 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 you know, all this stuff is so old to me. And when you do it, and all you who are designers in the audience know, when when you do it, you do it. And you get it just the way you want, and then the manufacturer or whoever you're doing it for accepts it, and then it goes, and that's it. Goodbye. And where's the next job? So you don't really think about it. And all of a sudden, I saw this, um, this clock in the New York Times in the middle of a page on the New York Times that big. I mean, it was crazy, and it was because the head of our department uh, at that time, who was a woman, incidentally, um, oh, isn't that awful? I know her name so well. This is, this is what happens when you're 97. You, you know things so well, but just when you're going to say it, <laughs> it cuts out. So I'll think of her name. I mean, she was... She's terrific, and still is. Um, she, uh, Deborah, Johnson. Deborah Johnson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, is she here? No. No. Um, she's mostly at her place in Connecticut now, where most of the work is done. But um, she had decided that there was something happening, I forget, that related to design, and she wanted Pratt to be mentioned there, and she chose the clock to show. And I was so shocked, but that's what I mean by luck. If she hadn't picked that clock to put in the middle of a page in the New York Times, which was funny, uh, then it would just be another design that was 
done, you know? Well, how did you come up with the design? What was the, what well, was the you know, kind of requirements? Was, at that time, CBS was developing their, logo. their yeah. logo. And I thought, that looks like an eye. And I thought, well, you look at clocks and it's like an eye. Why don't I do something like that? And then, of course, you sketch and sketch and sketch and sketch and you go through and you find things that seem to be sort of interesting and sort of you react to it again. And then you just sort of do it. <laughs> and that's, you have to have a good eye. I just did it. But something like this has to be made really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And the Howard Miller uh, company mm -hmm. really kept exactly to everything you wanted. The finish and the size of, of something and the way one material is connected to another. Mm -hmm. All of that uh, with a product that somebody can pick up and look at or hang on the wall or do whatever they're going to do with it. That is so important. And that's what a lot of people that aren't industrial designers forget. Mm -hmm. It's the who, what, where, when, how of design. I mean, who's going to use it? What sort of an environment is it going to be used in? Mm -hmm. Where is it going to be used? Uh, what is it really? I mean, can you think of it differently than you thought of it before? Mm -hmm. And uh, why are you designing it anyway? You know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what industrial designers bring to, uh, to a product. Uh, it's called industrial design. Does anybody know why it's called industrial design? All of Pratt knows, right? Because industrial design means it's, it's made in multiples. It's produced. Uh, it's not handwork. It's not craft. And that's why uh, way back when Raymond Lowy, uh, who was the only person who anybody knew way back in the 40s and the late 30s, uh, he, I don't know he, whether he developed the word industrial design or not. That would be interesting for somebody to find out how far back that was really used and who really des uh, developed the word. But he was the only industrial designer anybody knew. And when my mother would say, my daughter's studying industrial design, and people would say, she's an engineer? No. And then she'd have to go through the whole thing of what industrial design was. And she got to uh, be able to uh, repeat the story over and over. Because it is, it is a confusing term. And many times at IDSA, it was considered, maybe we should change the term. Maybe it's not the right term for what we do anymore. But it was tried, and it didn't work, and it went back to industrial design. Well, so. it's working with industry. But at the same yeah. time that you're working with industry, there's also, there's still also, I mean, you talk about all the the beautiful refinements that Howard Miller yeah. Clock Company was able to do on that. So there is still a craftsmanship that's very much, you the know, craftsmanship part, at I mean, the part manufacturing. of the factory. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you think of in some of the you know kind of other furniture design like Mies van der Rohe's you know chairs. Those are yeah. all like I mean, there's a lot of handwork still done oh, sure. in yeah. the industry. So. It's not completely abandoned, and I think that's um, that's what you know makes a really good piece of um, yeah. a good clock like this. And that's, but it's designed in multiples, so it yeah. has to be yeah. produced yeah. really well with a lot of thought. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, and I know furniture I'm, too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. so much because you use furniture, you're part of it, like we're part of the chair. I was curious if you, speaking of you know coming up with the design and looking at the eye clock, if you had any stories to tell about the beehive lamp that's now in the show. Um, 
the lamp that was acquired by Cooper Hewitt. Do you remember anything about the design process for the beehive lamp? Yes, um, the, um, the extruded um, acrylic tubing, it was the first time it had ever been used that way. And I used the acrylic tubing because it brought the light, it was only a, a 100 watt bulb and yet it seems like it's stronger. And the light bounces off inside on the white, that's inside the, um, uh, the hood. And then it brings the light down and spreads it. It was originally designed as a picnic table light <laughs> that would be, and all those, the others that you see were all outdoor lights. So they all can be taken out in the rain and it's so fine. These, these lights here? Yeah, they were all designed different types these, of light sorry, for outside, yeah, these, uh, on a patio or in a garden or whatever. And uh, then people started using this over their dining table or in, a, in an office. In fact, uh, the really weird thing is that um, at Kipps Bay, where I, where I live, at the end of the hall, there was a couple that uh, he had a furniture store and his, his father had had it before him. And he took it over when his father died and it was on, uh, it was in the 30s on Lexington Avenue, I think, someplace, small store. Um, and they came in once and he said, oh, I had that light over, over my desk at one point. <laughs> He said, I've got, I've got one, and it's put away, but it's got a black top. I said, well, that was the original, black. And then um, he said, well, do you want it? And I said, sure, I want it. <laughs> so, so when I had, <clears throat> when I had uh, some painting done, they broke the bottom part. And I had his bottom part, so I just took it out and put it in. It was so great. <laughs> Yeah. So that's industrial design. <laughs> in terms of like yeah, the, I was the fortunate. Parts. So I still have it hanging over the dining table. That's yeah. great. But that, that was a, a case of knowing a material and what it would do and then using it in a way that it hadn't been used before. Well, one thing I wanted to, um, I know everyone's probably waiting to hear that one story <laughs> about Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I know I am. So, can we jump to Dunkin' Donuts? Because we're, we're getting short on time, unfortunately. Oh. Unless you want to talk about any of the, before we get there, some of the, you did China? I mean, this, yeah, I, I this, did China and glass this other, these, and all that. It's, yeah. That's what, you have to make a living, right? So, <laughs> so you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> So here's yeah. Dunkin' Donuts. This is a, a model that you did for Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, my son-in-law wrote a book about donuts, and he included <laughs> this story. <laughs> it's so funny. The story is, and uh, are you sure the Pratt people don't want to leave? <laughs> I mean, to God. Anyway, uh, I was with Sabrin and Murtha, and uh, I went there on a freelance basis. And uh, Russ Sangren had graduated from Pratt, and he called me and knew that I was doing freelance stuff and uh, going from an office to office, and that was great. I loved it. And he said, we're doing a lot of restaurants, and uh, we're working on Dunkin' Donut now on the uh, we're doing uh, the logos. They were doing corporate identity for all these various insurance companies and banks and whatever. And he said, they want us to design a uh, on the street, uh, street level, uh, run in and get a donut type place with just a few chairs and uh, the donuts displayed and all that. And I said, okay. Um, I'll come over and I looked at it and so I built the model and, and worked on sketches of course and this was like three weeks later. Um, 
built the little model, and uh, then I walked into the, I had used a lot of uh, orange because I loved orange in uh, sidewalk things. I mean, it draws you in. So I walked into the graphic department and they, they had all these graphics up and they said, it's gonna be a new graphic, you know. Yeah, okay, you wanna make a sign? I said, of these? And they said, yeah, and they were all black and gray, uh, black and white and brown, and they said, yeah, donuts are, are, are morning breakfast and warm. And I said, uh-uh, donuts are fun. And I <laughs> jumped up and down. And I said, no, take that hot dog lettering and make it orange and pink. They're my, my daughter's favorite colors for all her birthday parties. <laughs> so orange and pink, oh no, he said, forget it, no. So Russ came in and he said, um, yeah, do one, just one. So they were going there on that Friday and uh, their main office was outside of Boston. So uh, uh, Russ Engren and his, uh, the head of the graphic department went and they made their presentation. So I came in on a Monday and I passed Russ's office and I said, what happened? And he was on the phone. He said, go in the you know, graphic department. And I walked in and I said, oh, okay, what happened? What happened? Everybody was, uh, uh. Uh, they picked yours. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I, was a, I was a happy designer. <laughs> but I never realized they were going to keep it for a hundred years. <laughs> so so it was, that was in 1975, right? Yeah. So how and many, that It was weird ago. because my, my daughter would walk down this down some place and she'd say, I saw a Dunkin' Donut, they had my colors outside, <laughs> Dunkin' Donut. I said, yeah, I'll, I know. I, I, didn't, I didn't think anything about it. See, that's another situation where you do, the, you do the design and it's great fun and it's finished. Okay, what's the next job? And uh, that's what happened. But it's iconic now and you must look yeah. back just like I the mean, eye clock is iconic. Pratt I mean, did the... What is it, the 100 or the 20? I don't know which. <laughs> Most iconic yeah. uh, forms, graphic forms or something, and that was one of them. And the thing <laughs> is, so they're, still, they're still updating the logo. Now it's DD, right. I think. Yeah. But they still keep your colors. I mean, they, they keep the colors, yeah. and they dunk the donut in a cup of coffee, <laughs> I think, because the donuts have gone because they want to be known for more than donuts, I yeah. think. Yeah. And uh, I guess nobody's there that I knew, you know, that was years ago. I just want to <laughs> zip through these. Um, this is, um, these are tiles, the Pomona Tile Company, just to give everyone kind of a, a sense of the other work that she did. Um, and stop me if you want to talk any more about this. I want yeah, just to well, the tiles are in that, that book, uh, 100 Women Designers right. or whatever right. it is that, uh, I forget her name, oh dear. Um, now you forget Bard, her name. I know, now I'm gonna. <laughs> Pat yeah. Yes, Pat Kirkham. Yeah, um, yeah well, she wrote a great book. And uh, yeah, those are the tiles. The first time I said, how about a texture on the tiles? They said, oh, we don't have anything like that. Okay, that was Pomona Tile, they were in California. And so I did a series, and then I insisted on matching grout. So the grout became part of the whole thing, so that it, the, the texture and the grout worked together yeah. on a wall. And, um, and that, was, uh, that was when I was at, um, oh, I think that was, I can't remember now where I was then. And the, uh, this, this company wanted a talcum box that they were a uh, 
they're Japanese or, yeah, they were a Japanese company that wanted a talcum box that was going to be only in America it was going to be sold. But it had to look as if it came from Paris. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's really crazy. Okay, I'll do whatever I want and then I'll... I'll tell them that's the way it looks. So, <laughs> so, so I, I did that because it was, it was hand, it was a softness to it this way. Well, what was it made of? Because and, and it the was a plastic. It was a plastic, uh -huh. um, and yeah, you know, that's all I can remember about it. But it sold talcum powder. I mean, poof, 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 poof. <laughs> okay, and that was for Costco. Um, yeah, and the um, the ones in the back uh, were the, those two large pieces were going to be made in ceramics in the beginning. That's that's why I was called in. They said we want to do a, two ceramic pieces that are going to be made in uh, Japan <coughs> or in in uh, Asia someplace. And then they found out the company couldn't do it, so they said, well, why don't we do a whole line? And this is the source and we'll make it all of aluminum. So they, this is an aluminum line. And they took off the, the wooden handles or they, or they became another material at some point, did you say? Yeah, they were, uh, I can't remember what they used for the handle. I wanted it to be a, uh, I wanted it to be wood. Mm -hmm. But uh, they changed that. Yeah. Uh, Manufacturers will change, and you can't scream and yell too loud because they do it for price. They do it because of a certain market. Uh, they do it for a lot of reasons, and all of you who are designers will face this or have faced it before, and you just are so disappointed, but you can't fight it because they say, well, this is the way it is. We have to do it that way. There's one, do we have time for one story? Yeah, absolutely. There's such a difference between the way various cultures use something. And you don't realize that until a story like this came up with a, a friend of mine who was a da, designer who was doing something for a Japanese company who wanted, they, uh, he had done something for them before that they liked very much, but this was only going to be sold in Japan. So he said he, had, he they thought he knew Japan well enough, and uh, he designed this thing. It was a small sort of something held by hand, and something that had to be turned off and on, but turned off rather quickly and it had to be obvious how you turned it off. So he designed this whole thing. I often wish I had asked him more about it because he told me the story very quickly and I was like, what? So he showed the prototype to the Japanese manufacturer and uh, a week later they called him and said, we can't use this. The Japanese didn't know how to turn it off. They don't turn things off like that. You've located it in a spot. They would never think of turning anything off, especially something that had to be turned off like that. So we had to redesign the whole thing. So that's another thing designers have to realize that if they're designing for another culture, they better know that culture pretty well. Yeah. I think we're getting to the point where I think I might open it up for questions, if there are. I have, there's more slides that we can go through. Um, <laughs> but if there are questions, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to. Yep. Wait, let's wait for a mic, please. Yeah, I don't hear very well, but I don't see much of anything. <laughs> you know, I have, uh, I have glaucoma and uh, macular, so uh, during the day I can see better than other times. So, yeah, I can't see who you are. Yeah, maybe you, you can also um, say who you are so that she can, in case if she... If I know you yeah. or if I don't. Lucius, Jeff, Jeff Kapek. Ah. How are you? 
Um, question regarding formulation of form through computer versus eye and hand. Say it again. The difference in your in your your viewpoint, having designed for so many years. Today we're doing using computer a lot to create form, but when we look back at the way we teach at Pratt and the way Rowena taught and the Bill Fogler and all the other and you know wonderful professors, the difference between developing form through eye and hand, using your eyes and using your hands to see the form evolve versus just seeing it on a computer screen? Well, I don't know. I think it depends on the person. And I can't put myself in the position of the generation that's using their computer almost totally. But I know at Pratt, I think and I hope, they still insist that you learn how to sketch and how to develop ideas on a piece of paper because um, developing ideas on a screen, you wind up with something that maybe doesn't connect as closely with someone. And that's a whole other subject. How many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on the school and the way, the way they teach. And I can't pass judgment because I've never designed anything just using a screen. I always have to sketch something. You talk to architects, they always have to sketch. And I'm hoping that industrial design follows that because you always have to sketch, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Good. One question answered. <laughs> Any other questions? Hey, Alicia. I'm Dee. Um, I just had a quick question about in the challenges that you faced early on in your career, what kept you motivated? What, what? kept you motivated? What kept you motivated? What kept me vo Oh, because I loved what I did. Incidentally. Um, yeah, I guess I have to use this. Um, Incidentally, that leads me to another thing that I always told students, do the thing you love because that will carry you through the tough times in your life. Do the thing you love. If something else is gonna pay you more, it may not carry you through the death of a husband early in life, death of a child, the death of the uh, difficulty in some other area, or uh, the loss of a house by fire. I mean, all these horrible things that happen to people, but they do happen to people. So if you have one thing in your life that you love to do, that can carry you a long way to uh, accommodating yourself to the problems of life. Um, sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't answer your question. What was your question again? <laughs> you did. Yeah, I did in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I have a question about when you designed your your pieces, your product. Did you have user testing? Did you have people trying it out when you said that? Japanese culture just didn't know how to turn it on. That's an extreme of culture to culture. But w what was the practice in, in the studio um, when you were designing things for people? Well, I think <clears throat> in George Nelson's office, it was assumed that you thought of the who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, I don't know what Teague and Dreyfus were doing. Um, I know Teague was doing a lot of interiors and, uh, and George Nelson's office, those are the four offices that were big offices in the country and they were the only large industrial design offices. Now there are a lot of small ones and entrepreneurial type uh, 
offices, which is great. Um, but the manufacturer usually insisted that the prototype be exactly as it would be if it were manufactured. And they would test it, depending upon what it was. Of course, it's the clock. Can you read it? <laughs> you know what time it is? No. <laughs> uh, it just depends what the product is. Um, but there was user but testing of there some There was sort. user testing at, usually at the manufacturing source once they got the prototype. Yeah. Any other questions? One other question regarding um, working with George Nelson. That was a, a very, I would say, successful office that did many, many beautiful products and exhibits. Um, and I you know, read his book, Le Learning How to See, or something like that. Um, but speaking to George about form and the way he would evaluate a design, could you speak a little bit about his approach to looking at something and determining whether or not it was a, a, an appropriate position for a, a form or a, a product? Well, you have to realize that George's mind was all over the place. And he never designed a thing. For instance, um, he would do a whole bunch of sketches and we would pin them up, and then everybody would come in and look at them, and he'd say, this is the way it should, it should be sort of like this, and, and you know, you'll, you'll figure out where it should be. Or uh, when we were doing the New York World's Fair for Chrysler, uh, originally, he did a lot of sketches and pinned them all up. And then we'd look at them and uh, ask him questions, you know, where do you see this? Is it a building or is this, is this little or big? He <laughs> couldn't tell from his sketches sometimes what the scale was. And um, then he'd say, well, you can just include it. It's the shape. You put something like that in there. You know, that was the sort of, and that's why he could, uh, he could handle all of this stuff, including the architecture, uh, because he would think very broadly. And that's what you have to do when you have a big office. You can't look at an individual thing. You have to get in on the beginning feed all the information in, and then let your designers that you've hired, and if you've done a good job of hiring, you know them well, uh, let them develop the idea. But his ideas were, uh, for instance, when we were doing the kitchen for, uh, what was it, GE, I guess it was, an experimental kitchen, um, he said, why don't we have something that revolves, you plug in over here and, and bring over, and you can, you can shine your pots that way, or you can, you can clean them that way, or take, the, take the, uh, uh, the burnt part off. You don't have to keep scrubbing. You know, why don't we have something like that? And uh, I don't know whether that was ever included, but that's, that was his thinking. Uh, when he was doing the um, uh, the house with Ronnie Beckman, uh, this uh, multiple housing uh, project, I forget who he was doing it for, but uh, he had all these ideas he would feed to Ronnie, and Ronnie had his own ideas, and so they were they were like this during that uh, during the development of that project, but. Uh, he knew when to say, uh, it's yours, you know? And that's what's important. He was the generator of the ideas a lot of times. But the only thing I had, in, uh, uh, the only thing that he developed with me was not really anything except handing me 
this stack of stuff. That was the first time that I had ever been de uh, designing for something that he had brought in. Uh, otherwise, I was doing it for Herman Miller or Howard Miller that were uh, with the company for a long time. With had, We'd been doing things for them for a long time. But uh, when he handed me the stack of stuff for, um, uh, for uh, Abbott Laboratories, and then I thought he was going to be hanging over my shoulder and saying, what's that? That's it. Here, you do it. So that's what, if you're going to have a big office, that's what you have to do. Yeah. Does that answer the question? I forget what the question was. <laughs> you answered. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. I go off on a tangent someplace you, and. You oh. did. You answered it. Okay. You have to tell me. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jerome. I have a question maybe for the, anyone from the panel. Um, but I want to bring back something that Lucia said about in her career there was a lot of luck involved. Um, but I also think that luck is also a skill. Um, what is a skill? Luck is a skill. Luck oh, luck. <laughs> can, you, can anyone speak about maybe how you created your own luck as women in your respective industry? I don't think you create your own luck. I think you are prepared well prepared to be able to use it when it comes along. If, if my going into uh, talk to uh, the designer who said there's an opening at George Nelson, if I hadn't had a portfolio that was really well worked on and exacting and and I had stories about each thing I had designed at Monty Levin's. If I hadn't been prepared, and if I hadn't talked and looked <laughs> as if I could handle whatever they had there for me at George Nelson's, he wouldn't have hired me. But it was the luck, my just walking in and then presenting myself at the right time at the Nelson office when they needed an industrial designer. On their end, they didn't care if I was a woman or a man, really. But I had a portfolio that was good enough for him to say, yes, we'll hire you. So that's what I mean by preparing in that other 10%. Well, that's really good advice, I would say. <laughs> Um, the thing that I would add to that in terms of making your own luck or seizing an opportunity is to um, take risks, make yourself available to opportunities. And I think in terms of establishing our own company and growing a business together, we talk about it as continually jumping off a cliff <laughs> because and the cliffs, they just keep getting bigger as <laughs> the company gets bigger, the opportunity shifts. Um, and you have to have faith enough in yourself, in the process, in the work that you feel confident to take that risk. And you know, sometimes we fall flat on our face, but without taking the risk, we wouldn't know and we wouldn't move forward. So I think that's another piece of advice I would share. I didn't get that at all. <laughs> I didn't understand. Is that a question? No, it's a statement. It's a statement. Oh, okay. yeah. Good. Um, last question. Anyone? Okay, if not, good. Thank you, Lucia. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you.